Welcome, everybody. So sure glad to see you here today. Um, everybody on Zoom, of course, and also live stream in various locations. And Jacob's here. He's in New York right now. And uh, let's just pray and get started. Welcome, everybody. Father, so we thank sure you glad to see you here today you with um, praise and admiration. Everybody on are, Zoom, of course, and, and for what you've done for us. We thank you so much for your living word that we can learn from and depend on. And we pray that you would teach us today and give Jacob the right interpretations of everything and help him to, to do a good job teaching today. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Before we commence our Bible study, something that we need to talk about, as we've mentioned, and I ask people to think about it and to pray about it. Do we have any concrete proposals. Remember, it has to be something that will be okay for new believers and older believers, something for people who are new to the Moriel type teaching and people who've been with us for a while. It has to be a one size fits all type of thing. Um, we're, we're almost to the end of, of, of uh, Exodus. We have one more chapter after this. After today, we do the high priest garments again, but we need to look at what we're going to be doing after that. So I throw it open for a very few minutes. Proposals. All right. I've got um, people saying John and Mark. That's what I've got so far. The Gospel of St. John, the Gospel of St. Mark. Either three, one of three Johns and uh, one Mark and... Also, Genesis and Matthew. So it seems to be heavily in favor of the New Testament, the Gospels. Three Marks. Uh, no, three Johns. Three Johns. One Mark. One Mark and one Matthew. Okay. Well, the three Johns seem to have it. We'll begin with the <laughs> Gospel of St. John after I get back to England. That will be, <clears throat> Lord willing, in two to three weeks from now. But... Thank you so much. So we'll begin with the Gospel of St. John. Uh, right now, though, I'm in New York, and we shall be at the Church of the Open Door at 7 p.m. this Saturday on um, 3rd Avenue and 7th Street, opposite Cooper Union, Church of the Open Door with Pastor Dave Rosetto, who was just with me in, in Marco's Church in California. Now we are together in New York. The following day, on Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m., we shall be at the Church of the Open Door in Baltimore, in Baltimore. And those details are on the Morio website, moriel.org, on the itinerary page, or just Google Moriel itinerary. So we're at the Church of the Open Door in New York this Saturday evening, and we're at the Church of the Open Door in Baltimore Sunday afternoon. Um, after that, I'm in England on the 23rd. I'll be joined by Pastor Tim Leach and by Pastor Mark Jackson at um, the Memorial Affiliated Fellowship in Winsford, in Cheshire, England. Winsford, Cheshire, England. That'll begin in the morning at 10 o'clock. Again, I'd refer you to the Morio website. If you're in the north of England, anywhere from Merseyside, Manchester area, possibly um, um, Staffordshire, uh, and Cheshire, please join us in Winsford. Winsford, uh, I'm right on the high street. The details are on the Moriel website when we'll be back in Britain. Meanwhile, we are here in New York City. Turn with me, please, to the book of Exodus. Once again, chapter 39. Exodus chapter 39. Now, a lot of the content in, in Exodus 39, <clears throat> we've already elaborated on to some degree in Exodus 28 in terms of the design and the fabrics and the tailoring of the high priest garments. We'd also refer to Jesus as our high priest in Hebrews chapter 4, where we know the ironic high priest was a shadow, a type of Christ. Let me preface matters by pointing out certain <clears throat> things. First of all, we have the Aaronic high priest, the Aaronic high priest and his garments. Josephus, much later, 
1,400 years later, also writes a description of the high priest garments that varies but does not contradict what is in the Torah. So we have the original Aaronic high priest garments. The second thing we have to look at is the combination of priestly and royal garments in the book of Revelation. There's a combination of priestly and royal garments in the apparition of Christ in Revelation chapter 1. But we need to understand that that was prefigured by when they put the purple robe on Jesus and the crown of thorns on his head at his crucifixion, mocking him. <clears throat> now, obviously, the crown of thorns was replaced by gold uh, in the book of Revelation, but Jesus was wearing priestly garments or priest, a combination of priestly and royal garments in Revelation chapter 1, and in a matter of speaking, Although they were mocked, the Romans were mocking him, he was wearing such garments at his crucifixion. So when we look at the high priest garments here in Exodus, we have to remember it's foreshadowing Jesus, both in combination with the royal garments, but also in his role as our high priest in Hebrews. Finally, a distinction must be made between the normal ironic high priestly garments, the normal ones, and those worn specifically only on the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> only on the Day of Atonement. What we see in Exodus 39 is the ministry of Jesus as our high priest. But as he makes atonement in Hebrews chapter 4, as it's described, it was rather the specific garments that varied that were in use only on the Day of Atonement and Yom Kippur, okay? They were different garments. Now, what would happen is this. The high priest would wear the garments we're going to look at now, but on the Day of Atonement, when he went into the Holy of Holies, he put on these other garments, which were more white, and he went in to make the atonement once a year on Yom Kippur. When he would come out, he would take off those special high priestly garments for the Day of Atonement and put these normal ironic ones on. And in the ritual that took place on Yom Kippur, the people would grab hold of him and try to pull him and prevent him from going home when he left the temple. As he left the temple after making the Yom Kippur sacrifice, the people, the crowds, the throngs would literally grab hold of him in, 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 in a, almost a ritual pantomime, trying to act out stopping him from going home, um, dressed in his normal garments after he wore his high priestly garments. Now, of course, this foreshadows Christ. I go and prepare a place for you. The apostles did not want him to leave them. He had to say, I'll never leave you or forsake you, speaking of his presence with us by his spirit. But when he went to the cross, he was in one mode. When he came off the cross, he was back in his normal mode. They saw him as he was when he appeared to them after his resurrection as the one who had been pierced. Uh, it foreshadows what happens at the close of the Gospels and in the first chapter of the book of Acts. So this ritual with the high priest. Now, if we were to read Alfred Edersheim, who did a brilliant job in his day, although his writing is quite old, it's still relevant. It's still a masterpiece. The wicks for the temple, lamp, for the lamp of the temple representing the word of God, were made by twisting these Yom Kippur garments into wicks that were used for illuminating the, the menorah inside the temple. Um, Edersheim's book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, is one I would recommend. It is a rather big book, but it's one well worth reading for those who are seriously interested in the Messianic background of the New Testament.
I would also say that um, Edersheim, he was a Jewish believer. He was so far ahead of his time, and most of the other messianic scholarship and research since his time is still based to a large degree on his original work. There were other people, like David Barron would be another. There was certainly Franz Delich. There were a number of scholars who came out of that time. But if I was going to recommend one book, it would have to be Alfred Edersheim, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Anyway, the Yom Kippur garments could be destroyed. They could be used for other purposes. These garments could not. They, they were tailored and sewed together in such a way that they would not rip along seams, that they would not tear, that they would not split. These were unrippable. The eternal high priesthood of Jesus, when he went to the cross as the high priest to make atonement, that was a one-time perfect sacrifice was sin for all time, Hebrews tells us repeatedly, as does Peter. He only wore those garments once, as it were. Christ only wore those once. Christ died once, okay? But the high priest, and then they were torn and used for other purposes. The high priestly garments we read here in Exodus are designed, sewn together so as never to rip. This speaks of the eternal high priesthood of Jesus, the eternal high priesthood of Jesus, who makes intercession for us. Now, the Yom Kippur garments have to do with his making himself a sacrifice. The high priestly garments of Exodus 28 and Exodus 39 have more to do with the ministry of intercession. Certainly, there's the sacrificial ministry, but it is more to do with the ministry of intercession and other things, as we will see. Turn with me, if you will, please, to Exodus chapter 39, bearing in mind we'll be referring back to some of the things that we've already previously looked at in Exodus chapter 28. Just a quote from 28 verse 3 before we begin in chapter 39. You shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that they may minister as priests to me. Notice, even in their physical performance of using tailoring skills, they needed God's wisdom to do it. We should not demean things like deaconship. We should never demean things like operating the practicalities of a fellowship, looking after the poor, looking after food, looking after money. We don't do those things as simply human skills. <clears throat> Being a good cook is a good thing, and God can use that. But when you do it unto the Lord, there is a divine wisdom in it. So, too, you may be a certified public accountant or a chartered accountant. That in itself does not make you a church treasurer. When you use those skills unto the Lord, there is a divine wisdom in it. There is a divine wisdom in both the physical, practical things we do in areas such as deaconship, as well as in the things that we would normally consider to be more spiritual. No, they are all spiritual. They are all spiritual. The scripture tells us in Corinthians, first the physical, then the spiritual. We remember the deacons in Acts chapter 7. Before Stephen had the ministry he had up to the time of his martyrdom, he began as a deacon. He began as a servant. He began as one who waited on tables and did physical things. God raises up servants. Do not demean those who do the practical things. There's a gift of administrations in the book of Corinthians, a little gift of ministry of administrations. Good ministries, good churches would break down without people who have the gift of administrations. Now, somebody may be a professional office manager or a professional administrative assistant or a professional coordinator in the secular business world. They may be that. 
But when you do it unto the Lord, there's a divine wisdom that comes into it. That would be the same for music ministry. It would be the same for medical missionaries. The human skills are there. But there is a divine wisdom given in addition when these things are done in the service of the Lord. Let's look at Exodus 39. Moreover, from the blue and purple and scarlet, notice those three colors, blue, purple, and scarlet. They made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place, as well as the holy garments, which were for Aaron, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Remember, the holy place is not the holy of holies. The holy of holies was only on Yom Kippur, the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Sanctum Sanctorum, that required separate garments. These are for the holy place where the sacrifices were made. You had the outer court, you had the holy place, and then the holy of holies. This is for the place of normal sacrifice, leading normal worship before the holy of holies, but not entering it on the day of atonement. And he made the ephod of gold and of purple, blue, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. The color could also be interpreted from the Hebrew as sort of like violet. Then they hammered out gold sheets and cut them into threads to be woven in with the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen, the work of a skillful workman. Notice it was not just gold colored thread. It was actual gold stretched out, thinly stretched out gold. <clears throat> Verse 4, they made attaching shoulder pieces for the ephod. It was attached at its two upper ends, and the skillfully woven band which was on it was like its workmanship of the same material of gold, of blue, of purple, and of scarlet material, significance to all these colors, and fine twisted linen, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now it begins to get a little bit complicated because we look at this in Hebrew, but we look at this in the Septuagint Greek. And then we look at these stones in the book of Revelation chapter 21. They don't seem to exactly correspond. The reason for this is in part the complication of translation issues. The Greeks had different words for the same things. That is part, at least, of the explanation for the apparent variances. Pay attention. The high priest looked like the temple. He looked like the tabernacle. He looked like the tabernacle. He looked like it. In his colors and in the gold, he looked like it. Okay? Remember, John 1.14, the word became flesh, the logos became sarks, and katoskenod, tabernacled among us. Our high priest tabernacled among us. He looked like the tabernacle. The colors, patterns, and the metal embroidering, embroidering with gold was the same. He looked like it. Jesus referred to his body as the temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Carried to us as a Maggio Dei beings made in God's image and likeness, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The church corporately is a temple. It is always the same pattern. The out of court corresponding to the body, soma in Greek, guf in Hebrew, the holy place corresponding to the soul, that is nephesh in Hebrew and uh, suke in Greek, and the holy of holies, our spirit where God's spirit dwells. That is the pneuma in Greek and the ruach in Hebrew. It's always the same pattern. The church, 
our bodies, the body of Christ, Jesus himself. It always follows the same pattern, and this pattern reflects the triunity of the Godhead. Okay? It always reflects the triunity of the Godhead. Jesus corresponding to the physical, the word was made flesh, who has known the mind of the Father, and then the Holy of Holies, okay, the innermost man. The Spirit searches the depths of God. Let's continue. Verse 5, and skillfully woven band, which was on it like the workmanship of the material of gold and blue and purple and scarlet, always the same material, fine twisted linen, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Now the stones, and they made the onyx stones set in gold filigree settings. They were engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the son of Israel. And he placed on the shoulder piece of the ephod as memorial stones for the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he made the breast piece the work of a skillful workman, like the workmanship of the ephod of gold, of purple and blue and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It was square. They made the breast piece folded double a span. <clears throat> long and a span wide with folded double. And the, and they mounted the rows of stones on it. The first row was of ruby, popaz, and emerald. We'll come back to this. The second of turquoise, sapphire, and a diamond. The third, jacinth, Agate and amethyst, the fourth, beryl, onyx, and jasper. They were set in gold filigree settings when they were mounted. And the stones were corresponding to the names of the sons of Israel. They were 12 corresponding to their names engraved with the engravings of a signet, each with its name for the 12 tribes. Now, this tells us certain things. One, these had to be stones that were found in Egypt. That doesn't mean they had to be mined in Egypt. They could have come to Egypt through trade, but they were available in Egypt. Second, when they left Egypt, they may have come from a further distance, or they may have been produced or mined in Egypt. Secondly, they had to be hard enough to be stable, but soft enough that they could be engraved. Hard enough that they would be solid, but soft enough that they could be engraved. And thirdly, they had to be large enough to write on, to write on the names of the tribes. Those three characteristics, okay? And they made the breast piece, in verse 15, chains like cords of twisted cordage work in pure gold. Again, it was not gold thread or fabric. And they made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings. And they put the two rings on the two ends of the breast piece. And they brought the two gold cords to the two rings at the end of the breast piece. And they put the other two ends of the two cords on the filigree settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephrod at the front of it. And they made two gold rings and placed them on the two ends of the breast piece on the inner edge, which was next to the ephod. Furthermore, they made two gold rings and placed them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod on front of it close to the place where it joined above the woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breast piece with its rings to the gold of the ephod with a blue cord, that it might be on the woven band of the ephod, and that the breast piece might not come loose from the ephod, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he made the robe of the ephod of woven work all of blue, 
and the opening of the robe was at the top and the center of the opening of a coat of mail with a binding all around its opening that it might not be torn. Notice these could not be ripped. And they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material and twisted them to the hem of the robe. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around on the hem of the robe, alternating a bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe for the service, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they made the tunics of finely woven linen for Aaron and his sons, and the turban of his fine linen, and the decorative caps of fine linen, and the linen breeches of fine twisted linen, and the sash of fine twisted linen, and the blue and purple scarlet material, the works of the weaver, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and inscribed it like the engravings of a signet, Kodesh Yehovah, holy to the Lord, set apart the Yahweh. And they fastened the blue cord to it, to fasten it to the turban above, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was completed. Now notice, it counts the garments as part and parcel of the tabernacle itself. Jesus spoke of his body as the temple. Okay. Just as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 33, they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars and its sockets, and the covering of ram skins, which was again the weatherproofing, dyed red and the covering of porpoise skin, and the screening veil, the ark of the testimony and its poles and the mercy seat, the table, all its utensils, and the bread of the presence. We've looked at these things in previous Bible studies in weeks past in this series. The pure gold lampstand, the word, with its arrangement of lamps and its utensils and the oil for the light, the gold altar and the anointing and the fragrant incense, the veil for the doorway of the tent, the bronze altar and its bronze grating, its poles and its utensils, the lava and its stand, the hangings for the court, its pillars and its sockets, the screen for the gate of the court, its cords, its pegs, and the equipment for service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting. Then we go back to the garments in verse 41, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, the garments for his sons to minister as priests. So the sons of Israel did all the work according to all the Lord had commanded. And Moses examined all the work and behold, they had done it just as the Lord had commanded this they had done. So Moses blessed them. James, can we show the schematic, please? Okay. Now, we just read it, but now let's look at it. It's hard to follow what it's exactly talking about simply by reading it. We'll go from head to foot. First of all, the turban. The turban is distinct from the crown. The turban separated the skin and the hair from the crown, but it held helped hold the crown in place. It was distinct, the crown of glory. The high priest was a shadow of Christ, but it is Jesus. We crown him with many crowns, okay? He is crowned as the king. In Christ, we are a generation of kings and of priests, but he is the king of kings and he is the high priest. The saints in Revelation threw their own crowns before him. They took what they had, the glory that God gave them, the glorification that God gave them, and they threw it at Jesus. They threw it at Jesus in Revelation. To him be the glory. 
the high priest would not have the crown touch his own head. It belonged to Christ. This is called the keter. The crown is called the keter. We notice on his shoulders, the two shoulder plates with the onyx stones. Then there was a white linen tunic underneath, a white linen tunic. Now this goes all the way down and describes even his undergarments, the linen pants that are not there, but they're described in the text, okay? Everything touching his skin was completely white, okay? We see the linen tunic, again, pure white. We see the ephod then, kind of uh, a garment that you would put over that the breastplate would hang on, okay? Inside were the urim and the tumim, the urim and the tumim inside the breastplate, which also had 12 stones, 12 stones on his shoulders, six and six. Here it is three rows of four, okay? The blue robe. Okay, now on his, on, on the foot of the blue robe, who also has an ifad, we have the pomegranates, which some scholars relate to meaning the word of God. Um, rimonim, rimonim is, 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 is the Hebrew term. Okay, it's also the modern Hebrew word for the hand grenade. But uh, forget I said that. <laughs> Uh, just because the hand grenade looks like it uh, in the IDF. So you have a pomegranate and a golden bell. Now, you may have heard some people say the bells were there, that if the high priest had sin on the Day of Atonement, he would have a velvet teen or a velvet rope around his ankle, and if they heard the bells ring, it meant he had sin and he dropped dead inside the Holy of Holies, and they had to pull him out by the rope around his ankle, and they know he dropped dead because the bells would ring. However, this is not the wardrobe. These are not the garments he wore on the Day of Atonement. He wore different garments. Um, so that interpretation, although it sounds fanciful, you, it, 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 it's not per se true. He wore different garments on the Day of Atonement. Okay. Underneath, you have the linen pants or trousers, as it were. And, of course, there was a, a, a crown. Notice there was no shoes. No shoes. Take off your shoes. You are on holy ground, God told Moses. Moses was unique. He's a type of the Messiah, as was Aaron, but he was also from the tribe of Levi. Moses had a prophetic function and a priestly function. A prophetic function and a priestly function. Now, when priests foretold or spoke the word of God, they did it differently than prophets. Apart from Moses, they did it differently. They did it by what you see, the Urim and Thummim. We are not exactly sure what these stones were, but we know what their purpose was, okay? The term is, of all things, is cleromancy. Cleromancy. It is the use of lots, the use of lots. Okay, in determining the will and purpose of God. Proverbs tells us the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Let us look before the Holy Spirit was given in the book of Acts chapter 1. The apostles need to find a replacement for Judas Iscariot to make the 12. Now, again, we've talked about this. This corresponds to the tribe of Joseph being split into Ephraim, okay, into the tri tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh um, to make it 12. 
because of the removal of Dan. Dan, the early Christians associated with the Antichrist. But let's look. Verse 23, they put forth these two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Barsabbas would be an Aramaic name. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, knowest the hearts of all men. Show which one of these was chosen to occupy this ministry of apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go down to his own place. Now, this idea of going to his own place suggests he will be back. I don't say he will be back physically as Judas necessarily, but the spirit of Judas as the son of perdition will indwell the Antichrist. Okay? And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Before the Holy Spirit was given, right up until the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, God was revealing his will through Urim and Tumim. Urim and Tumim. Urim has to do with lights. It means lights in Hebrew. Tumim, however, has to do with perfections, perfections, lights and perfections. You see the light of the Lord, what, what, what he's showing you, and what is his perfect purpose? This is not the only instance where lots, that is, claromancy, comes into play in Scripture, not by any means. The Feast of Esther among the Jews, the Feast of Esther, that is Purim, is known as the Feast of Lots, the Feast of Lots. And of course, we're coming up to the Feast of Esther within the next few weeks. Um, it's this time of year, for the Feast of Lots. It is something we see in the Torah, something we see in Esther, something we see all the way into the New Testament, but it was contained in the double-folded ephod, um, which was formed like a pocket or a pouch where they were carried, and only the high priest could administer it. When God spoke prophetically through a prophet, it was by the Spirit. When God spoke through a high priest, it was through Urim and Tumim. The only high priest who could also speak prophetically, and the only prophet who was also a high priest was Moses in the Old Covenant and Jesus in the New. Okay? Moses in the Old and Jesus in the New. Okay? High priests did not normally go around prophesying. God spoke to them and through them via Urim and Tumim. So, these are the garments. You have the white coat, the turban, covered by a mitre, that is like a crown. We do not know the exact precise shape, but it is probably not a bishop's mitre in the Roman Catholic or Anglican tradition. Those mitres most likely are what we see in the archaeology in Crete, in Nassos, the religion of the Philistines who worshipped Dagon, the fish god, and they resembled fish heads on their heads. They would wear this kind of hat, for want of a better term, that where the mitre comes from, that had to do with Dagon, the worshiping of the fish god, okay? Um, what the high priest would wear was not a single head covering. It would have been a crown that would be mounted on a turban, a crown mounted on a turban, okay? Now... Let's continue. The sash would be embroidered. The sash would be embroidered, but always following those same colors. Okay? Blue, 
okay, purple and scarlet, okay, always following those same colors. Now, let's look further. You've got these 12. The high priest garments look like the tabernacle itself, okay? It looked like the tabernacle itself. Let's begin to understand this. You got it with the high priest, but then you got it with the tabernacle. And ultimately, we have it with the eternal city of God in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Let's look there, please. We've got the new heaven and the new earth, then the new Jerusalem. Okay. And it speaks of her brilliance coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 11 was very costly stone as the stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. This all goes back to Jacob's prophecy of Genesis 49 and to the close of Deuteronomy. There were three gates on the east side, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The same as you had the 12 sons of Jacob, the princes of Israel, you have the 12 apostles corresponding to them. One the Old Covenant, the other the New. One for each tribe. One for each tribe. Okay. Now let's continue. They were the apostles of the Lamb, and the one who spoke with me in verse 15 had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. Okay. And the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles, its length and its width and its height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards, according to human measurement, which are also angelic measurements. Now, it's talking about cubits and things like this. We translate it into imperial measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city were all adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony the fourth, emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoprys, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and each of the gates was of a single pearl. Must have been a huge oyster. And of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Okay. This is the dwelling place of God. There would be no, per se, temple in it. No sanctuary. The Lord himself will be its temple. Okay. The Lamb are its temple. The Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. I will dwell in the midst of thee. And the city has no need of the sun or moon and things of this nature. These things we only need now. When perfection comes, it'll not be that. Okay. Only those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, let's continue looking at this. The north. The north. What is on the north? 
the tribes of Reuben, Judah, and Levi. We read them down. Topaz, Corbuncle, Sardius, Emerald, Sapphire, Diamond, Beryl, Onyx, Jade. Okay. Reuben. Reuben is Emerald. Judah is Sardonyx. Levi would be the Sardium. Three on the north. Joseph, Jade, Benjamin, Sapphire, Dan, White. Now again, there's a restoration of faithful people from the tribe of Dan. The tribe itself was cut off, but there were faithful people within it who would come south. Remember that. Okay. Then we have Simeon, Orts, Issachar. Amazonite, Zebulun, Olivina, Gad, uh, Chrysopes, Asher was a lavender color, and Naphtali was amethyst. We find this same pattern throughout Scripture. On the north, Reuben, Judah, Levi. On the east, Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. On the south, Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun. And on the west, Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. Okay? And all of these tribes play out in biblical history. The north, the east, the south, and the west. Reuben means looking at the sun, and it's also the name of a precious stone. Okay? Judah, represented by the sardonyx, and then the priestly tribe of Levi. It's the north, the east, the south, and the west. Mount Zion is on the sides of the north. That is where the people would look upon the Son of God. It is where the Messiah would be sacrificed, hence the priestly tribe, and the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. Those are on the north. Okay. Then we have Joseph. Benjamin, I'm sorry, Reuben uh, on the north. Then we have Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan on the east. On the south, Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulon. And on the west, Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. These correspond to the stones, and the names of the tribes are etched or engraved carefully on the stones. They had to be big enough, solid enough, Yet soft enough, okay? On Yom Kippur, different garments, different, the world of Catholics call them vestments, different ceremonial garments. These are the normal ones. And the normal garments were worn for the ordinary sacrifices, not the Yom Kippur sacrifice, not the Yom Kippur sacrifice of, of, of the goat that's for the Lord. And secondly, these would be worn for discerning the will of God by means of Urim and Tumim. Okay. Urim and Tumim, discerning the will of God. That would be the second function. Okay. And then, again, the ordinary sacrifices and for, the, for discerning the will, the will of God. Okay. Normal vestments. Normally, what he would wear. The ordinary sacrifices, discerning the will of God, and just leading the conventional worship. Okay. This would be what the high priest would wear. Now, six stones on one shoulder, six on the other, 12 over his heart. The breastplate had to be mounted high. It would cover his heart. We have to understand the difference between prayer and intercession. Paul makes a big difference. 
He says, prayers and intercessions. Intercessions are called entuxis in Greek. Entuxis in Greek, okay? To intercede in Hebrew, if you don't know, is le haf gia. Le haf gia. It's not to pray. To intercede is not simply to pray. There's a difference in both Greek and Hebrew, a big difference between prayer and intercession. People should not throw the term intercession or intercessory prayer around lightly. To understand the difference, turn with me to Isaiah 53. Verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. He was pierced through. Tugga, tugga. The Hebrew infinitive to intercede, lehabdia, lehabdia, F and P are the same in Hebrew. Lehabgia comes from Paga. To be torn, to be ripped into. The garments of Yom Kippur could be torn. These garments could not be. They could not be. This priest could do things. He could bring sacrifices. But it's not the same as Yom Kippur. He could pray for the people, but that's not the same as interceding for the people. Intercession means being bruised, damaged, wounded on behalf of another. We have some people who have the gift of faith they're often described as prayer warriors if they really have the gift of faith. Now, prayer warrior is a description, but that's not what it is. It's people with the gift of faith. They know the outcome of a matter that they're praying for because they're not simply praying for it. They're interceding. Okay. Paga. Others can say you're carrying the burden for somebody else. When you pray, you pray for what you're praying for. You can pray for the government, for an election. You can pray for somebody's healing. You can pray for the salvation of souls. You can pray for God's blessing on missions. You can pray, you can pray, you can pray. And then you move on and pray for the next thing. But in intercession, the burden is always on your shoulders and always on your heart. The burden for Israel was always on the shoulders of the high priest and always on the heart. We've got the 12 tribes. We've got 12 patriarchs and 12 apostles. The burden is always there. You can arbitrarily pray for someone or something. You cannot intercede. You cannot choose to intercede. It is not possible to choose to intercede. The Holy Spirit must put the burden of Jesus, our high priest, on your shoulders and on your chest, on your heart. It's not going away. It's 24-7. It's wounding to you. You carry that burden. Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, we're told in Isaiah 53. When Jesus was being tortured on the cross, and he said, Father, forgive them, was he praying? No, he was interceding. It was more than prayer. It was intercessory prayer. They are two different things. Not until the burden is won could the high priest take that off. And the burden was won, as it were, by what happened on Yom Kippur. Jesus conquered sin and death in his resurrection, but after he dies. That is it. 
Intercession is intercession. Prayer is prayer. Intercessory prayer is something different. Somebody cannot choose to intercede. You must ask the Lord to place the burden on your shoulders and on your heart. You must be willing to take and carry that burden, knowing that that burden is not going to be taken away until the final victory is won. Now, that's quite a difference between prayer and intercessory prayer, between prayer and intercession. You've got these things, lapis lazuli, they came from far away. The biggest source of lapis lazuli that we still have today is in Afghanistan. There may have been trade with these other cultures and civilizations. They had these stones, but lapis lazuli would have been a rare one. And as a rare one, it would have been a very expensive and precious one. Okay. A very expensive and precious one, in part due to its beauty, but in part also due to its rarity. Okay. So these are the high priest's garments. They correspond to the tabernacle itself, which foreshadows Jerusalem above. The stones correspond to the tribes. Carrying those stones on the shoulders and on the heart, on the ephod and on the shoulder plates, it's carrying the burden. It's intercession. It's not merely prayer. Okay. Now let's look at this a bit further. The white, there must be total purity. Somebody who is not pure of heart, somebody with unconfessed sin in their life, is not in a position <laughs> to intercede. On the Day of Atonement, Everything had to be white, white and scarlet. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. There was a different chromatic typology on Yom Kippur to this one. Now we're looking at this one, okay? Turban, the crown, the stones, the tunic, the ephod, the ornamentum, the breastplate, the blue robe, the gold bells of the pomegranates, the linen pants, the crown. People were to know when the high priest was approaching by the bells ringing. Jesus said, we're two or more and gathered in my name. I am there in their midst. The bells somehow correspond to the spiritually perceptible presence of Christ. The spiritually perceptible presence of Christ. You hear the bells ringing, you know the high priest is there. You know when you're in deep prayer that Jesus is before you. You know when you're witnessing to somebody and the Holy Spirit takes over and they begin hearing the voice of Jesus speaking through you by the Holy Spirit, you know those bells are ringing. You know those bells are ringing. If the bells are not ringing, we may be acting in the flesh. When we're acting in the spirit, the bells are going to be ringing. We will know his presence. Believers are to know his presence. Many people do things in the flesh. They may do them with good intention, but their works will be burned up. I have known people who tried to bless Israel and the Jews simply with social gospels and political activism on behalf of Zionism. Now, I'm pro-Zionist, and I believe in helping the poor of Israel and of other nations. But the gospel comes first. Uh, if Jesus is in something, the bells are going to be ringing. The bells are going to be ringing. We have organizations that sign agreements with rabbis and the Jewish agency not to preach the gospel to Jews. 
and they say they have a ministry. No, they don't. The bells aren't ringing. If Jesus is in something, if he is present, the bells will ring. The pomegranates, the word of God is going to be there. Okay. Now, these pomegranates have some kind of a relationship to the tzitzit. That is the prayer shawl worn by religious Jews with 613 tassels hanging, one for each commandment of the law. One for each commandment of the law. The bells always point us to the word of God. If Jesus is there, He's always going to point us to his word. He is the word. He is the word. Okay. Now let's look at this. In order to minister to the Lord, there had to be the purity. There had to be the white. There was always a white buffer between the flesh and the outer garments for ministry. Oh, the crown was there, and the breastplate was there, and the soldier soldier plate was there, and the ephod was there. These things were there, but didn't touch the flesh. There was always a buffer between the two. That buffer was pure white. Holiness, purity, righteousness. The servants of the Lord must always have that buffer. Must always have that buffer. There's always a need. Now, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would undergo an elaborate ritual called Mekudesh. He had to be purified himself because of his own sin before he could go in and minister before the Lord. Okay, the white. We are a kingdom of priests. We are a kingdom of priests. We are all called to wear that white. And we are all called to the ministry. What did the priests do? Well, they sacrificed. What are we told to do? Present yourself as a living sacrifice okay. in the character of the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Okay. But what else? They made decisions. Urim and Tumim. They made the right decisions. We are called to make the right decisions. We make choices. We deal with doctrinal issues. We deal with moral and ethical issues. We are called, in light of the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to make the right judgments. Urim and Tumim, lights and perfections. We're a kingdom a priest. Now, Paul says, for governments, I want prayers and intercessions. We can pray, but the intercession, the intuxis, God must put that on us. Right now, most of the important countries in the world have elections this year. The United States, Great Britain, India, these things will determine the outcome and the prophetic destiny of nations to a degree. All of these nations are in serious trouble. They do not have white garments. They have filthy garments. Our leaders cannot do the will and the work of God. Remember, governments are called to be the Lord's ministers in Romans. Today in the White House, you have people who 
endorse, sanction sexual perversion, the murder of the unborn, total filth. Pray by all means. But Paul says prayers and intercessions. British people should have the burden for Britain. Americans should have God's burden for the nation. People in India, where the Christians are being persecuted and the world ignores it, people don't realize how serious the persecution in India can be. We need to pray. Prayers and intercessions. We are a kingdom of priests. Only Jesus, of course, is our high priest. Now, Yom Kippur is something different. That is the perfect, ultimate sacrifice. Okay? That is the perfect, ultimate sacrifice for sin, where he takes the sin of others. Paga. He's bruised for our transgressions. Okay? But as priests of the Lord, we are to walk in this character. Okay? We are promised a crown of righteousness. Martyrs are promised a crown. Martyrs will receive a crown. But in eternity, we crown him with many crowns. The saints throw their crowns before Jesus. To you belongs all this glory. So we went from head to foot. But then we go from foot to head. When we come before the Lord, take off your shoes. You are on holy ground. Notice. When you're on holy ground, you're not to wear shoes. You are to physically experience the contact with God, walking with the Lord, walking in the Spirit. When we walk in the world, Jesus says, wash each other's feet. He told Peter, the rest of you is clean. It's only your feet. He moved the sandals. Wash the dust from the feet that has contact with the world. When you're on holy ground, we walk in the spirit. We walk before the Lord. We're not walking in the world. When we come into his tabernacle, we're walking on his ground. When we come into the fellowship, we're walking on his ground. We have literal direct contact with him. After we've washed each other's feet, take off the shoes, wash each other's feet, and walk with the Lord in the Spirit when we come before the Lord in his tabernacle. And so these things that we see in this chapter 39, and as we've seen in chapter 28, which relate to things we see in Hebrews and elsewhere, are crucial in understanding the nature and ministry of Jesus as our high priest, but also what he calls us to be as priests. You have the Aaronic high priests and you have the other priests. Among the priests, you have the Kohanim, who actually did sacrifices. And then you had the other Levites who were like deacons who did the physical things. The church is the same. You may be a deacon. You may be an evangelist. You may be a pastor or a missionary. Okay. But we're all a kingdom of priests. We're a priestly tribe, as it were. But Jesus, of course, is the high priest. Let's leave it there. We'll continue and conclude when I get back to England, Lord willing, next Thursday in the 40th chapter, the final erection of the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is erected, after that, we'll be looking in the New Testament to the Gospel of John. Sandy? Thank you so much, Jacob. Such excellent stuff. I really appreciate that. 
Hello, and thank you for watching Morial TV. There are so many things that are happening at Morial Ministries worldwide, from the Philippines to Japan, to India to Africa, and back to Europe and the United States. So many of our brothers and sisters are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to this lost world. We are so thankful for your prayers. God has been faithful and has blessed us in so many ways. If you'd like to partner with our efforts abroad and at home, please take a moment to click the link in the description and help us as the Lord leads you. Thank you very much and God bless.